Today we're making master copies with Aggie.io. What's Aggie.io? Aggie.io is a drawing program that happens in Interface. You can go to Aggie.io to see more about it. And its unique benefit is that it allows you to collaborate. So if I click a new drawing, for instance, here, I can go up here and I'm logged in right now. Uh, but I can copy this uh, invite button to the clipboard by clicking on it. And then I can paste this into chat and send it to other friends and see if they want to join me for a little drawing. This is great for things like teamwork exercises, uh, for collaboration on a piece, and also for getting uh, critiques. Uh, you can work right in the same document with a student or uh, with a colleague and uh, get exactly the feedback you need right there. Uh, many of the uh, constraints of Aggie.io are similar to other programs like Photoshop or Krita. So if you go to the help documentation, you can see a number of tips on hotkeys, and you're going to be pleasantly surprised to see most of them are going to be similar to what you might know in other programs. The exception is things that are oftentimes uh, because it's in the browser. So for instance, Control T is not going to transform. It's going to open a new browser window. So let's talk about what is a master copy and why we're going to do it. A master copy is something where you try to make the left of your document look exactly like the right. And <clears throat> site size is the act of doing this exactly the same size in the same document. Uh, this gives you a lot of benefits because uh, yours, as long as the uh, dimensions are the same on the left and right, you just make yours look like the other one. This is different from freehanding a master copy. A master copy is great because you get to study art history and uh, you know learn a bit about the artist. So for instance, this is uh, from the Rembrandt house in Amsterdam. And uh, it also trains your eye. There's all sorts of small details and trying to get accuracy from left to right makes your eye a little better at understanding these. Uh, it's also oftentimes the fastest way to paint. So for instance, you know a lot of people might be familiar with a more drawing based uh, workflow where you do construction and you're like, oh, maybe his eyes are here. <clears throat> and you can do this big complex drawing. But the problem is uh, you're spending a lot of time doing this drawing and uh, painting is its own pile of time. So sometimes one of the downsides of this is uh, this workflow is that um, after doing a bunch of drawing and figuring out all these small details, you then have to paint it anyways. So what I like about uh, master copies is, or um, the specifically site size methodology of Charles Barg, is that it lets you get to the painting as fast as possible, and it lets you get to the accurate placement as fast as possible. And that really is what master copies and site size and Charles Barg's system is all about to me, which is uh, accuracy as quickly as possible. And then you can always use flourishes and construction and all these other artistic techniques uh, on top of that accuracy. Master copies are also a great solution to a common artist problem, which is artist block. You don't know what you're going to do. You're sitting around in the evening trying to relax, but you feel like you want to make some art and no ideas are coming. Just find a painting that you like and study it. Now, let's get started. So I have two layers here. This first one is the uh, photo. And I worked out uh, that these are the exact same size on the left and right. I actually used Photoshop to cheat a little for that because uh, Aggie.io still doesn't have a lot of uh, robust features like rulers or uh, transform guides. So uh, I actually like this about it because uh, it lets me get into the master copy a little faster and embrace these constraints. So let's get started. You can create new layers over here with this little uh, plus icon and you can duplicate layers here. And layers in a drawing program are kind of like a stack system where the one on top is going to be the first one that you see. I'm going to move my uh, subject matter up to the top and I'll click this lock button, which will make it so that I can't paint on it. And because it's on top, everything I paint below it will uh, be underneath it. So I don't have to worry about accidentally painting over it. Uh, this photo isn't perfect. You know, it was shot with a cell phone. You can see there's also like a little shadow from the frame here. But you know, you know, uh, you work with what you got. I'm going to name some of these layers by double clicking on them. This is my reference. 
And I'm going to name this guides. Dots and lines. Let's just make all the layers beforehand. I'll name this one background. And move it to the bottom. And one more, we'll name this one color. Now to start with, uh, let's explain the theory of how to do a site size master copy. Essentially what it breaks down to is three steps. And I'm gonna start here on this background layer just as a doodle. Uh, the first one is accurate placement. Can you make sure that your thing is in the exact same place as something else. And so you can see I'm starting to make little marks here. And uh, one of these is called a plumb line. So and a plumb line, by the way, in Aggie.io, you can either just freehand it or you can hold shift and it'll make you draw in a straight line. And we want that one. So we're gonna break this down into a couple of steps. Number one, accuracy of placement. Number two, uh, accuracy of value. which means how light or how dark something is. And later on, as we dive into color, this is actually going to expand into three categories. Uh, the value is one of them, value. But with color, you only add two other variables, uh, which are is the hue and the saturation. And if you can eyeball the correct color here, uh, that'll help you to start building your understanding of this stuff and um, diving in more accurately right from the start. And as a result, you won't necessarily have to build up in layers uh, only to realize you wasted all that effort because you got the accurate color wrong to begin with. And number three, uh, finally, we can think about brushwork and uh, edge quality. So I like to think edge quality and brush quality. And that'll be stuff like, uh, you know, the boundary of where this guy's hat is. This is a hard boundary, whereas something like the transition into the fabric here is a soft one. And so you can put the right color down and then you just fix whether it's hard or soft later on. Let's actually call this. Yeah. Uh, so again, about embracing some of the constraints of Aggie.io, you can increase or decrease your brush size with the bracket keys just like in Photoshop. And you can color pick by holding Alt. But I'm gonna specifically avoid color picking uh, because I want to see how well I can train my eye to uh, get the right color uh, just by looking at it. So for instance, I'm gonna start with um, just something of this brown color. Maybe as light as it goes. <coughs> and this brush has a couple of attributes here, opacity and size. Well, let's start by just filling this whole thing in. And going to our guides and plumb lines layer. Now on this one, I am going to paint with black. So a plumb line is a directly horizontal or vertical line that is going to help you as a guide for placement. You might be familiar with something like a grid system where you lay down a grid on the subject and over here, and then you make your grade look the same as their grid. The problem with that is, number one, it takes a lot of tedious time uh, to set it up, and that's the whole reason we're doing this, is we're trying to paint faster and paint quicker and paint more accurately. 
on the flip side, uh, <clears throat> it's also something where you can have compound errors. And so the question is, how can we have a starting uh, system of guides that gets us a little more accuracy? Now, uh, horizontal plumb lines are really kind of nice because they are something where you can just kind of look at it from left and right. Wrong way. So I can kind of look at this point here and I can just sort of eyeball the idea that it comes from left and right. By the way, I am painting with a tablet here. So uh, you can do this with the mouse, but it is going to be a little harder on you. So I'm going to start by just making some horizontal plumb lines that correspond to some of these major landmarks. Like there's his knee. Kind of goes there. His hand is right here. This hand here. Kind of goes about there. The top of his head. It's about there. And I'm trying to specifically draw with um, straight lines as often as possible. So our starting idea here is uh, these plumb lines are going to help us uh, with some of these uh, placement things. Now, uh, next we need a horizontal plumb line. And this is a little trickier because we don't necessarily uh, have an exact idea of where the midpoint is, but we can sort of think through it. And we can also instead pick a landmark. So I think right here, if I were to uh, draw on top of this guy. Let's make a new layer. And move it up here. So you could imagine this being something where I find what I think is kind of the exact midpoint here. And if I were to pull this up, you can see that it kind of maybe lines up with that nose here. And I think what I want to do is actually assume that maybe this plumb line is right here on the edge of his eye and where this mouth is. But it could also be right here. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the exact center. Uh, but the point of it is that this is going to tell you a lot about what's to the left and right of stuff. So if I have this guy right here, uh, I can sort of visualize this. And you might oftentimes hold your pencil up specifically trying to make it as upright as possible and compare. And this will tell you things like when I'm placing this little finger joint here, this is going to be slightly uh, to the left of his eye. And so for all over the place, you can make these sort of measurements. Like right here, his hat kind of lines up where his wrist is. His ear here it kind of lines up with uh, where his jacket is. And so it's nice to have this as a guiding principle. So I'm going to go back to my uh, guides and plumb lines layer and go back to black and the brush tool. And I'm going to click once and then I'll hold shift and I'll try and draw this as straight as possible. I'm going to actually use a smaller brush. So again, I think right around here is the midpoint. And so I think this point is going to be slightly off of the midpoint. So right around here is the midpoint. I am trying to eyeball this as much as possible. Because again, who's got time for a grid? So slightly to the op offset of that is where I'm going to draw that. Now, the next system is using a series of dots and lines uh, and trying to draw this as straight as possible. Um, and you want to uh, sort of oftentimes be um, really big with these ideas. You want to have a sort of carving mentality. So, for instance, I'm making big shape ideas here. Uh, 
And as I work, I can also place some more of these uh, plumb lines. So right here, where this comes over, you can see with this horizontal plumb line, this beard is a little below where this chair is. So if I said the chair is about here, I'm going to say his beard is right around here. If this plumb line is where his eye is, and I can also start mapping where that is, I want to try and think of this as like a connect the dots thing. I'll sometimes also measure space and angles. So note that this is about a rectangle along here. And it also takes a certain amount of space that's a little less than uh, his arm. And what you start noticing when you do this carving style of drawing is that uh, your accuracy is going to change a lot. And we have a sort of psychological dependency on um, looking at things and seeing it as a form that is um, big eyes and a huge face and it'll get drift when you do that and if you're drawing like straight from the brain a lot of times you'll psychologically over enlarge these things and so uh, by doing this uh, in, a, in a less freehand way you tend to like uh, break out of that mental constraint and you can get to a point where you have a little more accuracy. So I'm trying to look for straight lines as often as possible. And I'm also thinking about um, how these compare size wise. So right around here, from there to there, right around here, from there to there. I'm going to say around here is where that arm hits. What about where this chair comes in? It's about there. Where's the plumb line for where it touches the canvas? Kind of right there. And constantly think about, like, well, if the eye was the corner that we're working from, uh, how does it go down from there? Uh, does that, uh, if it looks, it looks to me like this little chunk of fabric is a little further than that. So if this is my plumb line, I'll now make a little note that it's a little further along than that. Some of the benefits to this is that you start breaking things down into um, shape language rather than, um, you know, rounding forms and building this like an anime character. Um, so, for instance, this is just a big downward triangle for this eye shape. And uh, the more you do this, the more you start uh, noticing these things. So I'm going to try and find uh, between his beard here and his eye. I know where I put his beard. Looks like I got it pretty much right. And uh, where I put his eye. Oh, look at that. See, this is where uh, you start uh, finding out lots of accuracy issues. So I put his eye way too high up. And if I look, I can see like right here. Uh, now that makes a lot of sense because his eye, that shape doesn't go any higher than this. So I have to lower his eye a whole bunch. So I'm trying to think of this as dots and lines only and drawing in a very uh, straight way where uh, the lines that I use, and I'm holding shift while I go, oh, looks like I got that a little off. Even this feels a little bit like cheating to me. <coughs> So 
So again, I thought the hand was a little further along there. So as you go here, I'm trying to think of this as, you know, big shapes. And like, you know, look at this, you know, if you take your glasses off or you squint, you can sometimes break this down into something. And you just see this, these two hands as like a connected yellow blob. And it starts becoming more and more accurate. What about a plumb line from here up? You'll note that this corner of the hand is just about a little bit off from the, the hat. And so over here, if I know where the hat is, I can sort of plan ahead for that. Now the other thing you start doing is uh, <clears throat> it can be a lot of help to turn these shapes into an idea that is something beyond what you're actually looking at. So for instance, this little shape here, uh, you know, it goes down. And if I was trying to like figure out where the knee is, that can end up getting really confusing. But if I just draw something like this, you can start seeing it as like a whale. Or, I don't know, a tobacco pipe or something. Stuff like that. Uh, I sometimes think of this as drawing a bird. Because uh, all these shapes, you can start seeing it as some sort of bird cartoon character. Where, you know, here's his hat. You know, And by doing this, you can start to have more accuracy. Because you're psychologically um, removing that impulse to just draw the face in a big circle and uh, big eyes and stuff like that. Now I've done this a lot and so you can sort of tell based on how I am just sort of diving in here and uh, just automatically doing things like seeing this shape of the nose here as almost like a whale tail. One tip I often tell people is to avoid erasing as much as possible. I am doing a little bit of erasing right now. Um, but one of the reasons for that is right. I keep having to move my eyes lower. Look at this big forehead shape. You should think about that. So it's better to just, uh, instead of erasing, um, you know, a lot of times erasing is a sign that you did something wrong. Um, and so as often as possible, it's also just frustrating to use erasers and the undo history uh, in a digital interface because what happens is each of these little lines is an action. And so you end up hitting control Z to undo over and over and over. And it just takes up so much time and it just feels like a giant waste. But the more that you do this, the more you find plumb lines everywhere. So like you might be tempted to in a construction based workflow where you're like, oh, here's my head, and here's that, and there's my eye line. You might try to make these eyelids too similar on this axis here, but all the time I'm doing things like, <clears throat> you know, comparing this line here uh, 
you know, if I was to draw a line here, I can immediately see, well, this one has to be uh, a certain amount lower. His ear is just about at the point where that comes in. Another thing I recommend sometimes instead of erasing is using opacity and using layers. So I have this guides and plumb lines layer. I've gotten a fair amount of work into it. Uh, my, most of this should have actually been on the dots and lines layer. But uh, what I can do now is lower the opacity of this layer. starting there. <laughs> and now what I can do is I can start drawing on this layer with more accuracy now that I have sort of idea. So instead of using um, instead of using undo and instead of using the eraser just use layers when you need to uh, figure it out. Uh, just switch to a new layer. Uh, or make a new layer on top. And draw on that one and it tends to be much more accurate. Now this is the dots and lines layer. Now at this point I'm sort of uh, getting this stuff a little more accurate, but I'm still keeping it fairly rigid. I'm also gonna go to the background layer, color pick this. I'm going to merge this layer down. And so now this has both of those. And also, it's still on the low opacity. No, I'm not going to do that. Pardon me on just a bit of cleanup. Actually, uh, give me one sec. Now at this point, I've brought in a value scale. This is just a chart that goes from zero, which is pure black, to 10, which is pure white, and steps uh, in between this. And this is just a little visual helper to show you how dark things really are. So a lot of times people will work slowly and they'll s sort of assume that like pencil lead, it'll build up to the accurate value, but that can take forever. And uh, <clears throat> if you were mixing paint, for instance, it's very handy to know exactly the color you're going for and get it right immediately. Then you work on top of that uh, with newer and newer layers of paint. Uh, some of the things you might notice, although this is in color, uh, if I were to, for instance, I don't know if we have any tools like desaturation. I don't think we do. But if I were to desaturate this uh, so you didn't have color distracting it, um, it's just worth noting that like, what's the lightest light in this whole painting? It's probably right here on his forehead. And it's probably like an eight. 
How much is lighter? It's not even that. The lightest light in this whole painting is around like a six. That's really dark. So, you know, I think this is something that people miss when they're looking at stuff. And, and there's some subjective things going on. I mean, this was a cell phone photo and I adjusted the value or like the exposure when I took the photo. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it's a little subjective, but you know, people don't realize that you really should be, if you're trying to make an accurate painting, you should be reserving uh, your whites for like your brightest, brightest things. And everything else needs to be squashed down. Uh, this value block, uh, my dots and lines are, you know, they still have some errors, but I'm going to try going into the value block in, and I'm actually going to uh, be using color while I work, but I'm going to try and pick colors uh, that are as accurate as possible right away. And I'm going to do this on um, the value block in layer below my dots and lines so that as I work, I can still see this chart. So worth noting that there are a couple of brush options here like density and opacity I'm going to lower the opacity which will make it so that this uh, is not as aggressive when I paint with it I want to be pure black though I can also lower the hardness which will make it so that it's a little fuzzy and the density will make fewer things come out as I go But I want this to uh, be a lay-in, and I want this to get accurate pretty quick. I'm going to keep the hardness up. I like using a hard brush. Uh, and you might notice errors as you go. So, for instance, I can now sort of see this as a, like if I were to map this out with red on this top layer. Um, the more you paint, the more you start noticing these big shapes. So... You know, this shape, like from here to here, is really what I want to be thinking about, even though that's the background. And when you see it like that, it starts making a lot of sense. So I can tell on this side that maybe I need to uh, make that a little more like this. And, you know, I do think I had some feature creep where I was making his head bigger as it went uh, this way because it's just psychologically what we do. I'm going to turn this off for now. Now, if you're a beginner, this is oftentimes very, very intimidating because, oh no, where'd my line drawing go? And now you can't see it. But, uh, you know, you have to start thinking of it as, you know, it's all line drawing, just lines on top of lines as you go. And, you know, painting is just drawing and drawing is just painting. And I can start getting a little more freehand here, but like right here, I can really see some of this uh, error. Like this should be uh, a bigger shape. So I'm gonna start doing that sort of rough color. Now again, I could color pick off of this by holding Alt, but I really don't want to. I want to try and get this uh, eyeballed as successfully as possible. yellow oh no I was painting on the right layer well, the only choice is to merge it now right click merge down a layer Now at this point, I'm also going to start holding Alt a lot because as I paint, you know, if I put a stroke down and it's kind of in between two colors, chances are I can just color pick and find that. Once 
to draw on the wrong layer. You just constantly have panic attacks about drawing on the wrong layer again. This is a little too light, the color effect. But you know what? It's kind of somewhere in between there. If I click, if I draw it kind of gently, somewhere within that stroke is going to be the accurate color. And so it's much easier to just approximate like that as you go. Warmer for stuff like this. That was wrong, so I'll add some black. Let's maybe get that orange shape in. So I really think of this almost like a Rorschach test where you're trying to see very big generalities and tell yourself a little story about how this is a snake or this is a whale. And, you know, I'm not looking at uh, this guy as like a human being. I'm trying to look at him as a illusion on a picture plane. Even shapes like this. Let me create a new layer. You know, whenever I find a good shape and I think about these things, it makes me really happy. So like, there's this shape right here for the light area on his coat. And to me, it, it looks like a baby bird who's like, ah, feed me. And once you tell yourself a little story about that, you can oftentimes go back to this and get it much more accurate right away. get that red in as quickly as possible. I mean, really, the goal is speed, 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 speed. You want to go fast because the faster you can paint, the faster you can go to the next painting. So I got my baby bird. And then this kind of, this is too light. So it's a little too light. And it's a little not saturated enough. And a lot of times, you don't have to sort the color right off the bat because you have all the colors you need right here.
And you're probably noticing one of the real benefits to these like shadow shapes. There's this one, there's like the Y. Uh, is it really, at this point, it's, it's just a coloring book. I'm just finding the shape area and I color it in. And it goes really fast. Make something look a little more orange. A little brighter. Where does it compare to this? So, you know, I don't think of this as something where uh, the line drawing, uh, the sort of uh, initial drawing is like uh, the law of the land and you have to follow it. It's just like your first best approximation and it gets you pretty far. And at this point, I'm starting to figuring out, uh, figure out the next step. So like I'm thinking a lot about plumb lines still in terms of how this comes down, in terms of how these things go together. And a lot, a lot, a lot of just holding alt and color picking. Take the last off. His hat is way too, way too light. Need to add more of that. from here we get into a sense of continuous refinement we go like that sometimes i like to scumble which is to use like a really big brush lower the opacity you really like this overall area needs to be darker Now we're starting to look at accuracy of saturation and value as, uh, or saturation and hue as well. So it's sort of difficult to tell where is it a little more red, where is it a little more orange here. You go back and forth with that. Uh, a lot of times for me, uh, what I am looking for is um, value first. And, well, I guess placement first, value second, and hue third, and saturation, I kind of, you know, sometimes I wing it. Well, I think at this point, I'm getting so close now that I might go up to my color finish layer and start painting on top of my line drawing. So dots and lines are slowly getting covered up. And at this point, you might no longer have them. So on this color finish layer, here I feel like I can really start going to town. Now, one of the limitations of Aggie.io is that we don't necessarily have uh, fancy brush heads and like textured brushes, uh, but you can pay for the pro version and get that, which if you can pass that along, Maybe your work or your school pays for it. It's not so bad. Uh, so a lot of times what I look for is I'll try and find like something that just has a touch of a specific chroma, like where on his face is just a little bit blue, 
you know, there's a little bit of blue tones here in his beard. And I'll do a little bit more of that like pepper crumb technique that I love. So a pepper crumb, like imagine you have like a palette knife and you just need it a little bluer. You can get like a tiny bit of blue and mix it into whatever you're working with. It'll kind of pay out later. So like I might put a little bit of blue here just because I see some blue uh, highlights in his beard, maybe in his hair here. And I'm absolutely aware of the fact that this is going to get covered up as I go and it's not going to last, um, but that's okay. Because I'm just painting this approximation sort of methodology. So all the time I love doing this method of I slap down black, it's too much, but then I color pick somewhere in the gradient that happens from the start to the finish, and that ends up being what I go off of. Grab some of this pink. His hat comes down, and his ear is actually right about there, I think. There's a fair amount of black behind it. So when you first start off, you're like, this, is, uh, this doesn't seem fun. But I am actually doing a fair amount of uh, you know, a more uh, curvature-based sensibility now. So at this point, I might start slowly working my way up with lines like that that go that way. Maybe something with a little more yellow and a little more brightness and we'll go like that. And I'll use big brush and a small brush. And I'll just mix these together slowly but surely. But it just pays off to have this like big shape first, like way, way big shape. And you know, it feels so scary to have like that giant marker tip. Uh, but know that you can then, you know, it's so much better to paint those big details and then add the smaller details as you go. So this goes like that. And you start thinking about like, what was going through Rembrandt's head when he painted this? Did you work? Um, and you get like little hints like, you know, the black of the hat is like this border and it looks like he added just a little bit more lightness behind him so that the hat would really pop. And, you know, in this way, like, you can really like put yourself in the footsteps of these artists. Um, really see it almost from like a historical perspective. And that's one of the real rewarding things about this is you'll start noticing all these things that you would never ever notice by looking at a picture like you know you take a picture on your phone you would never ever go this in depth and understand it to the level that you do when you do a master copy the more I use Aggie.io the more I like how you know it's only got uh, these like five things here's my baby bird and just a little bit of this brown color to lighten them in. Caw, caw, caw. And the more you draw with this shape language mentality, uh, the better you're going to get at it. And the more you start you start to just like look at bus stops and people on the street and items in the grocery store, or interesting shadows. And, you know, you can like instantly figure them out because you're going to train your brain to like figure out what a shadow shape is and uh, what's the fastest way to interpret it. It really ends up becoming, you know, sort of like abstract art or, you know, it doesn't feel like it's based in this, realist tradition but it is it's like absolutely 
something where these like silly shapes are something that pay off. See this? So now if I compare this to this, I kind of have the placement right, but mine is way too bright, and I think the hue is a little off. So I can maybe just color pick a little bit of this chair here. And I'll paint over it. I'll also go back to this black. And Of that in there. Look at this tiny little detail of how this rounds around his leg. Never would have noticed that. So let's think about this. Got this shape, which is here, here. If I drop a plumb line for this like red or brown shape here, it should line up with this, which means I need to put it here. Oh no, I'm drawing over my whale. Deal with it. It's not a big deal. So this should line up more with the hand. I think that's the other thing I, I really like when you can do this more. You know, again, no erasing, uh, no undo. I'm just, you know, when I make a mistake, the answer isn't to feel mistaken about it. The answer is just cover it up later. You know, it's just constant revision. And revising is faster than undoing. And you also like actually like learn why it was wrong as you do it. It really is at this point just constant color picking. And if you've ever done like oil painting, uh, you'll actually like notice a lot of similarities between these methods. A lot of times you have oil on the canvas and there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to make a mess, but you can sort of smear it around. And so if you have wet oil paint on one area and it's kind of close to what you need in a new area, you just go and scoop off what you're already working on. I have this tablet that lights up and I can like see my drawing, but I end up, you know, I never grew up with it. So I end up still just looking at my computer monitor. So technically here I'm here. All those like line drawings that I started off with, I'm not getting rid of them by deleting them. I'm just painting on top of them until they go away. Goodbye, scaffolding. I no longer need you. Look at this weird bird. It's like, ka. It's got like an upper beak that's too big and this lower one it's got this weird spike on its hair wait a second that's his fabric it's not a bird you know, the more you do this the better it helps mm. once it starts to take shape it just feels really nice Get the lightest color yet. And I'll just, at this point, you know, I've got enough of this face in that I can maybe just uh, restate some of this line drawing. And now it just feels easy. You know, I'm basically tracing on top of this.
So you can imagine how this training pays off because let's say you're painting from a live model and the person's only going to be standing around for a half hour. You could have spent, you know, I'm about uh, an hour of drawing, including a fair amount of this that was just like software demo time. And I've totally gone to live drawing and just done a drawing for an hour and then started getting my paints out and realized, oh no, it's too late. The day is over and I'll never get that chance again. So by doing this method, one of the best things about it is just look how fast I've gotten to something of a complete study. I think this needs to be a little more warm and a little darker. I'm looking at this just a little bit at a time. I'm trying to find these microscopic changes in the hue, which is how what color it is on the color wheel and the saturation which is how saturated it is and what's nice about these old rembrandts is like I tend to have used a lot of earth tones and it had an earthy subject so let's see I'm not even using the color wheel anymore. I'm mostly just going straight for my own stuff. But it's nice to also go in and at this point just maybe block out some of the line drawings because now I'm trying to think only with this other stuff. No undo, no fancy layers, no blend modes, no fancy brush head. And you know, again, like us digital people, you know, we're living in a digital world where we can do everything. And why do we sit around being like, wow, Rembrandt was really good at painting. Uh, why are we s impressed at this when we have so many other tools that we can employ? And, you know, this sort of stuff is still attainable. You know, it's important to remember that for all this fancy software we have, you know, painting is essentially pushing dirt and mud around with a stick. And so I don't feel like, you know, you need every Photoshop filter or every single brush pack from the internet in order to do something like this. This is a little, uh, not, it needs to be a little warmer, a little more orange, and then it also needs to be a little darker. And I'm not actually color picking anything, I'm just mixing right here on the layers to get kind of an approximation of what I want. No front to back, no. They didn't have undo back in the day. Stop trying to undo stuff. this little shape here 
basically the same color as his beard, so why not just use that? My rule for master copies is uh, I'm allowed to color pick off of my own painting where I've made all my drawings uh, and decisions, but I'm not allowed to color pick off of the source image. So that's my, my own personal code. And why I have a personal code about that? Because again, the goal here is to actually learn how to paint and it's nice to set yourself some constraints that'll make it happen. Anywhere where at this point I'm really just doing cleanup, but anywhere I see like a line should be more interesting. So at this point, like our last step is really like we're starting to have accuracy of our colors. We're having accuracy of placement. We've refined it and been willing to uh, adjust as we go if we need to make a big change, for instance. And so now a lot of what we care about is like accuracy of uh, accuracy of edge quality. So how do I make this beard look soft in the way that that is? I might change my uh, density here, which will make the brush a little softer. But my preference is to use hard brushes as long as you can, and then only switch to soft brushes like right near the end, which I think is, you know, personal preference, but just gets you to this end result fast. And I love I love overdoing it and then going back in and fixing it. So I'll do a brush stroke that is a little too dark and a little too big and a little too strong. And I just color pick next door and I undo it a little bit. So I'm going to do a pepper crumb right here. This is too bright. It's going to be too much. That's fine because I'm using a soft brush. And afterwards, I can color pick something that's less bright and reduce it. It actually worked out kind of okay, I think. I need a little more of this color. I like this. I want that blue. Same thing here. Let's 
get a little overboard. And then just go back over it. See, like, there's such a temptation still to, like, think, I'm going to model all this hair individually. Uh, and instead, if you think of it as shapes, like, this is like a black blob here and a black blob there and a little blue zigzag. There's my zigzag. There's my blobs. And it's easy to see some of these things when you're thinking of these big shapes, but as you go, you're going to start having to uh, work on smaller and smaller confounding problems. Like, what's the difference between black and slightly lighter black? Um, so, you know, I start caring less and less about some of these small problems, more and more about the big problems. And I should probably stop being such a coward about the hands. That's what everyone makes fun of artists for is when they are scared of hands. I don't know. That's pretty good for right now. You could work on this for another two or three hours. And I get the details in place. But I think this is, you know, this is sufficient to have shown off the big ideas. But it is nice to zoom way out and think, what am I really messing up on? Well, I would say at this point, looks like his mouth is coming down a little bit too much. And uh, we can also see here that I think maybe the darks in his face are a little too dark. Maybe his eyebrow needs to come down more. So at that point, you know, it's refinement and it's refinement and it's refinement. I'm just doing a little brush over to lighten everything there. Accidentally made that too big. Oh, and look at this lost edge. Yeah, let's just make that a little more obvious. So that's Master Copies, and that's Site Size, and that's a little bit of Charles Bark, all using. Aggie.io. Next time I should do this with a friend. <laughs>